we believe uh, that the lessons drawn uh, from the experience of the transition countries in Eastern Europe should be remembered uh, and recalled. Um, and Oleg Kavrilishin, uh, whose work and book brought us uh, here today, uh, is the best possible uh, reference in this area. Uh, we were proud to cooperate with, uh, with Oleg, uh, case fellow and outstanding uh, expert on system transformation. The list, the list of um, Oleg's uh, achievements and affiliations uh, is very long. Uh, to name a few, a lecturer of the University of Toronto and joint uh, uh, Vienna uh, Institute. Uh, Oleg served as a Deputy Director General uh, in the European Department of the IMF. Uh, and in Ukraine's first freely elected government, Oleg took up duties of Deputy Finance Minister and uh, Deputy Foreign uh, Minister. Um, Without uh, further ado, let me uh, introduce today's speakers, who are not only speakers, but uh, the catalysts of uh, today's uh, meeting. Uh, Professor Anders Astund uh, is a leading expert uh, and specialist on uh, economic policy in Russia, uh, Ukraine and uh, East Europe. Uh, currently professor of uh, uh, Georgetown University, uh, resident fellow uh, in the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council and Chairman of Case Advisory Council. Uh, uh, Dr. Aston served as an economic advisor to several governments, uh, to the governments of Russia, Ukraine. Uh, he published uh, uh, 15 books. Uh, he he uh, previously worked at Peterson Institute for International Economics, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and others. Uh, Professor Leszek Balcerowicz, uh, who is considered uh, the architect of Poland's economic uh, uh, reforms initiated in 1980, uh, 1989. Former uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Poland, Minister of Finance, Governor of the National uh, Bank of Poland. Founder uh, of, uh, of for the Civic uh, Development Forum, uh, member of, of the Group of 30 Advisory Board, Professor of Warsaw School Economics. Uh, um, uh, the discussion today between both professors will be moderated by uh, Christopher Haltrell, who is a <coughs> renowned expert and scholar specializing in institutional economics and especially in the financial uh, sector. Um, currently, the, the head of uh, uh, the International Management Institute at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences uh, School of Management and Law. Uh, professor at Kozmiński University, uh, visiting professor at Renepa, uh, and Case Ferro, uh, importantly, uh, former president of, uh, of Case. Uh, one technical uh, detail, uh, please, after the discussion, uh, the speakers will take questions, so please uh, uh, paste uh, your questions, write your questions on Facebook. Uh, uh, we will try to answer them after the discussion. And without further ado, uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Jagosh. Uh, it's an honor to be here once again with my case friends and out there in cyberspace to be able to talk about what is obviously a very important issue. I don't want to take up all the time here that our two luminaries have. And I was definitely put at the end of that list for a reason because I pale in comparison to both of our, our speakers. But I wanted to take kind of the moderator's prerogative and just mention a little bit about Oleg before before we get going. Uh, I used to work at the U.S. Treasury Department in 2001 to 2004, and so I coincided with the time that Oleg was at the IMF. And I remember meeting him and his co-author, Ron Van Ruden, who was also there, um, and just thinking that this guy was so nice. How is he an economist? There, the economists aren't meant to be this nice. And he was Slavic economist as well. Where was his pessimism? He was just full of optimism. It wasn't until years later when I came to, to Poland and, and was heading case from 2014 that I really was able to reconnect with Oleg then. And he was both instrumental as a reviewer for my 2016 book from Cambridge University Press. 
And because of that, I was a reviewer for his book, which we're discussing today, The Present at Transition. Um, he gave me one of the early versions of the book, and it was, you know, the collection of lessons that we had learned from transition. And it was, it was fascinating to read, but I said, Oleg, you know, this has happened before. We have had lots of these kind of retrospectives. Like you were there, you were on the front lines, you were on the ground. It's time that we really had, you know, your memoirs and your point of view here. So I encouraged him to kind of make it into a more mem uh, more memoir type book. And I'm very happy that he did. Uh, it reads, I think, much better with the human touch. And of course, now what we know in retrospect about his passing, I, I think it's a fitting kind of capstone to his career. So there's, there's my moderator's prerogative. Uh, a salute to Oleg is what we're here for. Mm. And to kind of touch on a lot of the themes that we've seen that, that, that he wrote about that our luminaries here have kind of worked on. So the first question I have would be for, uh, for Professor Balsarevich. One of the things that Oleg mentions, because he was a member of the international community, you know, he was there at the IMF. You know, he talks about the benefits and the costs and devotes a lot of ink to kind of the way in which the international community was there for transition in a way that it hasn't been, it wasn't present before and it hasn't been present since. Given that you are the architect of Poland's economic transformation, you know, what was your experience with kind of international organizations such as, such as the IMF or even more relevant perhaps the EU? And how did they help or hinder your own kind of actualization of economic reform? Okay, let me start with saying that Oleg's book is a great book because of extensive knowledge of what was happening in the former socialist economist extensive knowledge of Western economics were usually not very helpful on the regarding transition. And finally, very lively language. So that's a very, really recommend in this book. Coming to your question, <clears throat> let me first start that um, as far as the blueprint for what is called Big Bang is concerned, it was produced at home. And I'm, I'm not saying that because I just happened to be in charge of that, but this is the fact. The fact is that I had a hobby starting in the late 70s. I thought that there is no like in the tunnel, but at least we can improve somewhat the social economy without provoking the Soviet invasion. So I organized a group of then younger people to work on this blueprint for two years informally. And we came with the proposal for a more radical labor managed economy so that there would be more market, less uh, central planning. And we also proposed that par the party should not be present in the enterprises, which was naive. It was not uh, accepted by the authorities, but it was accepted by the solidarity movement, which originated in the, in the 80s. And this, I am saying that because without that, I would not be asked 10 years later to take to be in charge of Poland's economic transformation after the martial law. We continue without hoping that uh, someday Poland would be free to introduce radical reforms, but we deepened our studies on privatization, liberalization, market reform. When I say we, I mean the people, which I managed to gather. And all of a sudden, without uh, expecting, Poland became free because of what was happening, not only in Poland, but also in the Soviet Union. And after elections in June, the 4th of June, 1989, after two months hesitation, Solidarity Movement uh, accepted responsibility for the government. There was no uh, problem with finding many candidates for the Minister of Culture, a foreign minister, but there was not many volunteers <laughs> to come up <laughs> to take responsibility for Poland's economy. I was about to leave for Britain, but somehow I stayed. 
and I accepted the proposal of Tadeusz Mazowiecki uh, to be in charge of the economy, but why? That is because somehow we did the homework. So we presented, we elaborated something which was later called Big Bang, meaning rapid change on all the uh, important fronts, which was stabilization, liberalization, deep institutional change, etc., etc. So this was the second, there was a team. So without the team, I would never accept it. But I accepted only on the condition that we would do the big bang in this, according to this according to definition. Uh, and there would be a team, and they would be in charge of overall economy, not only economic transformation, not only uh, finance, even though finance was crucial, but no, was not everything. Institutional change was even more important. And everything we tried to launch in the past, according to these respective reforms, uh, differ in their maximum speed. You can stabilize much faster, you can liberalize much faster than you privatize. So differences in speed. But coming to your question, the blueprint came from Poland. First, now we learned on some subjects like stabilization, uh, I think IMF was helpful and they were partner in transition. And they were important also because without their stamp of approval, it will be difficult for Poland to gain recognition in the Western circles and to be successful in our strive to get a radical debt reduction. Because one of the burdens in Poland was the heavy debt incurred in the 70s and were mostly wasted. So they were building mines which were unproductive and in 1997 uh, I have to push for closure of these mines <laughs> when I for the second time uh, in a similar uh, position. So IMF was important, but not, on, not for the proposal for radical reforms. I, think, I don't think they have expertise because never that really with the transition from totally dominated state, state of the economy to a market economy. They didn't have expertise, but they were helpful on some other subjects and they were not obstructing what we did. The European Union was not very active because there was, there was yet no expectations in Poland in 89 that we would become members of the European Union. But they were interested, they were interesting. And I, to make this discussion lively, let me remember that uh, well, uh, in 89, I think in late 89, I met a delegation from uh, European Union headed by Mr. Jacques Delors and Mr. Dimar, a French foreign minister. And I have to explain to them what we are going to do. So they are going to a big bank and their reaction was frosty. They were not very enthusiastic. I remember that the most polite remark was, be careful so that economy is not dead. <laughs> <laughs> this was the reaction. This was very similar to the reaction of the majority of Polish economists. I met them in December 89 and presented to them what we are going to do. And then most of them were against it. Because they said, no, no, it's impossible. And in the West, they introduced convertibility uh, gradually. And you want to introduce conver convertibility of Polish brought uh, radical uh, and sudden. Uh, so well, I never, this was my last meeting with the Polish economists, in a, a Polish economic establishment. <laughs> they were <laughs> reformers. Now coming to the European Union, uh, so, so they were very frost. And, and then later I talked to Mr. Kandeshi, who was very helpful, uh, a Frenchman. And he came, uh, he was very much interested in Poland's reforms. And I, I told him that this was such a unpleasant reaction on the part of Mr. Dumas. Why? So he started to laugh and say, yes, because he came to the conclusion that you are a Thatcherite. And he strongly dis disliked Mrs. Thatcher. So, so this was the politics in the European Union. And to finish, let me say that also I, I met then later, or previous now, later, 
chairman of European Commission, Mr. Samter, and I asked him, why are you not insisting that Poland privatize fast? And he said, no, no, this is political. So the most important reform, a fundamental reform, taking economic power from the politicians was political, meaning not touchable. It is so. This shows, well, so you asked me about IMF, you asked me about uh, European Union. I have mm -hmm. very good bilateral relations, let me say, with ministers of finance. In my strive to, uh, to get the approval for radical debt reduction. And there were some of them were very understanding and uh, not obstructive regarding mm -hmm. uh, our big, big bank proposals. So I remember that in October 89, just two weeks after I became the Minister of Finance, the Prime Minister had to go to Washington IMF meeting to, uh, I was of course asked about our proposals. So I presented just a sketch of a big bank. Okay. They were not really believing, I think, that what we are going to do. <laughs> but they were watchful. <laughs> and once we started this doing, I think they became a bit more respectful. I was not doing this for their respect. I saw right. uh, what we are doing uh, in our team for the 10 years that this is, I think, the least risky. And the most uh, hopeful strategy if you inherit a, a bankrupt socialist economy. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It, well, there's two two big points there. Obviously, the first is that we forget from this vantage point, you know, how new and different and uncharted it was back then for some, even for someone like the IMF or for the EU to be able to kind of come in. And I think it's a great point. The IMF was all helpful on stabilization because they have experience and stabilization is universal. They have to do something about the supply of money. But on the institutions, they did not have sufficient expertise. On stabilization, there were partners, very helpful. And they suggested that we introduce some inflation anchors like a stable is lotted for uncertain time and we did it okay right exactly and then and then kind of the second point and this will bring me to the question that i want to ask to, to honors was about kind of the importance of being able to do this internally to generate this idea these ideas and have this blueprint and have it be owned in terms of, you know, this was a Polish plan. This was an IMF plan that was given to the Poles. Um, so Anders, the question I have for you is about this idea of, of leadership. I mean, Leszek has already spoken about, you know, how he was out front on this and then there were, we've had pushback from the establishment. Oleg uh, is, uh, he served in the Ukrainian government he had a great love for his country, and he seems in his memoirs pretty sanguine about kind of the role that the Ukrainian government had, especially kind of from the outset in the, in the Kravchuk government, about the leaders of Ukraine's reform. And, you know, he was optimistic on the, the, the role that they kind of played. What are your thoughts with your vast experience in Ukraine, and how is it kind of fed into Ukraine's transition experience? Oh, I need you to unmute, please, Anders. Thank you, Chris. And uh, <clears throat> I, of course, knew only very well for uh, three, de uh, three decades since we both lived here in Washington and both dealt uh, a lot with uh, uh, Ukraine. And uh, as uh, you and Leszek, I like this book. Uh, and uh, what Leszek talked about, um, strategy and uh, what works, he sorted out in two chapters. And then he discussed uh, your question, so to say, in uh, eight chapters. Uh, uh, why did it work or uh, didn't work? Which were the different groups and how did, uh, did they act? So it's quite differently um, structured than most other books, which uh, is an original value of uh, the book. And uh, as the big problems, he presents what we would expect, the old guard, uh, uh, red uh, politicians and red directors, 
oligarchs, uh, uh, corruption, and the role of imperial Russia, which I think is uh, quite important that it gives that much more uh, in, uh, importance than is usually the case. Because uh, what is now increasingly said is Russia exports kleptocracy and corruption by senior politicians in various countries and pay them well, uh, often after they are out of office, sometimes perhaps while they are still in office. That this is a very cheap way of spreading uh, corruption. And um, he has a, a good, a good eye uh, for it. Uh, uh, Oleg and I actually spent the middle week of August in 91 in Kiev. Uh, it was George Soros who had asked us to go there to uh, assess uh, the uh, economic reformers, how good they were. And uh, uh, since we had the Soros mandate, uh, everybody met with us. And um, my uh, impression was awful. I thought that these people hadn't got a clue about anything. Well, to be uh, been with uh, uh, none of them spoke English. So uh, or one junior economist spoke English. Uh, all of the others only spoke uh, Ukrainian and or Russian, since Oli spoke with Ukrainian and I Russian, we had to uh, combine a bit. Uh, but um, uh, the picture was very clear. These people didn't know anything about economics. They didn't know anything about the, the reality they lived in. And particularly one of the people that uh, uh, Oli uh, cites uh, told us, uh, the head of the Parliamentary uh, uh, Commission for Economic Reform, he said, we have only one economic problem, and that is Russia. If uh, we get rid of our contracts with Russia, then our economy will be fine. And that was uh, uh, the leading uh, uh, reformer in the, uh, the parliament, which means no reformer at all. And if you don't have the people who understand, uh, you can't get it right. So here I think that Oli is too kind to these people. And Oli uh, drew a somewhat more favorable um, conclusion than me, and he stayed uh, uh, at, uh, as a deputy minister of uh, finance in, in Ukraine uh, after, after this. But the conclusion that you can't really write in a book is that the, the fundamental question is, are the top people honest or not? And are there sufficiently many honest people? And um, uh, Leszek and Mazowiecki uh, did not make big fortunes. I find it difficult to remember any significant uh, Russian reformer apart from Yegor Gaidar, who did not become very wealthy. So Yegor Gaidar did not become very wealthy but uh, essentially all the others did. And what we're talking about is hundreds of millions of, of uh, dollars. The situation in Ukraine is quite similar. And uh, uh, the fundamental uh, issue here is, uh, uh, the fundamental issues are two. First, one of knowledge. And uh, I met uh, Leszek the first time at a conference in Cambridge in 1984. So we, um, as Leszek uh, and other Ukrainian, uh, Polish economists were part of the international stage. The Ukrainians, because of the harsh uh, repression by the KGB in Ukraine, because uh, uh, the Politburo was uh, rightly very worried about Ukrainian nationalism, they were kept under complete control and did not get any information anywhere. The discussion uh, was much freer in Moscow. I lived there from 84 to 87. And the discussion among economists was interesting in Moscow, in uh, Ukraine. I attended a econom big economic conference there in 1986. It was really awful. It was pure Marxism. Leninism of the worst uh, doctrine uh, kind. And so first you need to have decent, decent rethinking. 
left echo process, uh, so to say, the Western economics, uh, which is not uh, relevant. But uh, many of the thoughts uh, in the Western uh, economic thinking or you can say a broader uh, social science thinking are relevant and they were not present in uh, Ukraine and it was uh, true of most of the post-Soviet uh, uh, countries so the best thinking available was in Russia but in Russia uh, uh, soon other interests uh, uh, dominated and the other problem is money uh, are you working for money or not and we have seen in Ukraine group after group of uh, young reformers who have been bought. Uh, the standard issue in the Ukrainian parliament is that a parliamentarian thinks that he or she needs to get uh, $10,000 in an envelope uh, once a month uh, because uh, otherwise you're not being properly paid. And uh, uh, one of the uh, Ukrainian NGOs uh, a couple of parliaments ago uh, checked who in the parliament lived on their salaries and it turned out that there were four MPs uh, that worked on the uh, salaries. That was the NGO uh, Chesna, uh, honestly, that uh, uh, did so. So uh, competence uh, does matter and uh, corruption uh, does matter. These are the two fundamental big differences between, on the one hand, the former Soviet Union, on the other hand, the countries that have uh, joined the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, it calls to mind kind of the uh, what, what people used to say about Mexico, but is Ukraine so far from God, so close to Russia? Isn't it a pity? But in terms of themes, you know, we talk about kind of corruption, we talk about the Russia factor. And, you know, you mentioned the fact that Poland, that Lesha didn't get rich, that Poles did not get rich. Lesha, how did you avoid having an oligarchy in Poland afterwards? I mean, people talk about your know, privatization and cronyism and, and having people, Anders just mentioned having people bought off. How did you avoid having the oligarchy that you had just across the border in Ukraine? I'm coming to that question in a minute, but let me join others in this very important um, statement about uh, why some countries succeeded in Big Bang and some countries had not launched it. I think there's a series of necessary conditions which must be met jointly. To do. And first, as obviously, I agree with it, this must be a competent uh, leader and the team. <clears throat> and they were outsiders, outside of, even though Poland's uh, Polish economy was not as close to the West as, say, Ukraine. Uh, but still, the majority of economists were not, were not thinking in terms of institutions and reforms, etc., etc. And second, it must be uh, not a uh, sufficient political support or at least not a resistance to what a team uh, is proposing. And this was met in Poland, frankly, because there was no alternative team. <laughs> I accept it. And also, and then what I thought was very, very important, you have to be very fast, not only because of economic logic, but also because of psychological and political logic. Mm -hmm. And by kind of expression, the period of extraordinary politics, which is a gift of history, and is best used when you are very fast, being competent. Okay, so this is just something about um, choice of strategy. Now on your very important question is, I would divide, I would generalize a little and say, where are the, well, under what conditions it is likely that you get oligarchs in the sense of big rich entrepreneurs which got their money not from entrepreneurial activity but thanks to political connections. Okay? And I think there are two conditions. First, a lot of regulations uh, and a, a lot of state activity consisting in distributing money or licenses, etc. And second, independent from the first, from a presence of big state sector. Now, on the first in Poland, we introduced a massive 
liberalization, which was to some extent started even before eight or nine, but we completed it massively. And then you, there was a reduction in the power of the state because there were general rules for economic activity, a huge expansion of new private sector. And I think this was very, very important. But secondly, we still have a problem with the huge state sector because it was impossible to privatize 90% of the economy in a year. And there was a danger that uh, uh, some of these directors in state enterprises would go for shabby deals with their nephews, et cetera, et cetera. And we have, but we've been very watchful on the second point. From the very beginning, we have warned uh, the directors uh, of the enterprises and we've been watching it. Right? My, in my team, we have a special people who are watching the potential deals with the state enterprise directors and uh, new entrepreneurs. And there was an additional factor, which I think was unique for Poland. Or two factors. But there was a solidarity movement, which is the opposition movement, which was not a trade union purely. And solidarity was present in the enterprises and looking at what the enterprise directors were doing. Then solidarity degenerated into uh, normal meaning, not very good trade, but then under Lech Wałęsa, it was a movement for reform. And finally, I would say that we did not have so many opportunities for, for uh, oligarchs like oil sector, transmission, etc., etc. So opportunity was less. But I would say, finishing first, a radical, comprehensive liberalization limited possibility for getting money from the government. And secondly, dealing with the state sector as a potential problem for corruption through uh, members of the team and through solidarity movement. Thank you. Excellent. That's something I didn't know. That's that's very interesting that you kind of had bits of society acting as a check on other bits of society, something that you probably didn't see, uh, again, kind of further east, to kind of continue to develop this, because Oleg spends all of chapter nine talking on kind of correct corruption, post-transition corruption, and especially this kind of bureaucratic corruption. And I think one thing that we've all seen is this change you know, in the 90s, it was organized crime. But then in the 2000s, it shifted to kind of this state bureaucratic corruption. Uh, Gans Morris called it, it's gone from the mob to the man. And this is how we see the corruption. Now, we have this kind of sense of what was wrong in Ukraine in the 90s, 2000s, even today. We saw what happened in Poland and how it was kind of avoided. Uh, so my question for Anders is, Looking forward, how can we kind of break this cycle of corruption in places like Russia, Kazakhstan, and other former Soviet Union countries? I mean, even you look at a reformer like Georgia that has gone so far, they're still plagued somewhat. They don't have the problems like with the police that they had in the 1990s, but there still is this kind of corruption. You know, how do we get to breaking this kind of cycle? Well, in one way, uh, the, the answer is easy. These countries are autocracy and uh, the leadership has uh, to change. Without other uh, leadership, nothing can, uh, can improve. In the other way, it's uh, difficult when you get decent uh, leadership, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to change it. So as it is today in Russia, it's uh, Putin has uh, distributed uh, uh, <clears throat> the goods uh, in a completely feudal uh, fashion. All the big state enterprises are given to one of his friends, one, a person who's completely loyal to him. And it doesn't matter what they do as uh, managers. What is important is that they give, uh, are loyal to Putin and that they give the money to the right people. Uh, so this is uh, an organized state mafia 
and it's uh, similarly in uh, authoritarian countries. And we have five post-Soviet countries that are not quite authoritarian. Uh, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, and uh, Georgia. And in these countries, we are instead seeing uh, quite a mess that uh, there is a, a chaos. Uh, in Ukraine today, nobody can know what laws they will have next week because uh, the parliament might adopt uh, completely new laws. And uh, uh, this le leads to a sense of instability so uh, few uh, dare to invest under these uh, conditions. The property rights don't exist in the former Soviet Union uh, for one reason or the other, because of authoritarian uh, kleptocracy or because of, um, of uh, uh, chaotic uh, uh, legislation and, uh, uh, and uh, unclear oligarchic uh, uh, role. The one exception, as you mentioned already, is Georgia under Mikhail Saakashvili. So Saakashvili cleaned up from the top, and as Leszek previously emphasized, he brought in outsiders, young outsiders who were well educated and had a good experience from, from the West. So they knew what they were doing. And an additional advantage uh, with Saakashvili and his people was that they were lawyers. So that uh, normally we see, uh, have seen that all the reformers are economists and a natural consequence is that we don't know how to reform the legal sector because we don't know uh, sufficiently well how the legal uh, sector functions. Uh, I see three exceptions from this. One is East, uh, East Germany where the West German lawyers came in and cleaned it up. The, uh, the other is Estonia and the third is um, is uh, uh, Georgia. For the rest, there were very few lawyers who were involved in the reforms. You can say in Central Europe, the situation was not that bad because uh, in particular, Poland and Hungary had somewhat decent legal sectors before because they had uh, substantial private sectors uh, as uh, uh, before. So Poland and Hungary sort of escaped uh, this situa situation and uh, uh, if we look upon the post-communist world uh, today, it's um, uh, two countries uh, that stand out, uh, well, it's one country that stands out as much less uh, corrupt than anybody else, and that's Estonia. Estonia cleaned up everything from the top. So you can, uh, and uh, then in Georgia, a similar thing was done by Saakashvili, uh, but uh, the question is, can that be done in big countries? It's much more difficult to reform a big country uh, when it comes to fundamental uh, inst institutions. So what uh, should be done? Well, start with an honest uh, 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 political leader who has reasonable competence. If you el uh, elect a clown as president, then you will get a circus. And uh, that is not uh, a, a, a solution. Uh, you need both competence and honesty, exactly as with uh, uh, the reformers. And then you need to get a decent parliament, as uh, uh, Poland and other countries here in Central Europe had early on, and also the Bal Baltic countries. And um, then you need to adopt a lot of uh, laws uh, which are not paid for, but uh, are based on an idea. The must, uh, Leszek touched upon it, that you need many preconditions, and one precondition is that you have a clear reform program. So Leszek formulated the reform uh, program in September 1989, which was one page in the newspaper, Rzeczpospolita. You don't need to have a long reform program but you need to have a reform program that means clear principle. But Slav Klaus had 10 principles that he uh, repeated uh, all the time. It was very good in the early stages. Uh, later on, he should have expanded it, which he didn't do, but uh, it worked uh, very well for him uh, initially, and uh, it worked very well for him all along politically. 
but uh, that's, a, that's a, another matter. So the short answer is you need to start from the top with a competent and honest uh, political leader. You need to have a decent uh, parliament where the majority are there, not in order to make money for themselves, but in order to uh, improve the nation. And in order to get this, of course, you need a strong civil society. Something that I think was very important for Poland in the 1980s was that the millions of Poles had uh, lived and worked in the West. So they, they came in with another life experience than people had in the former Sov Soviet Union. The boards are there different because they had a strong national um, spirit. Uh, so that made them different, although very few had traveled to, to the West. The mind was in the West while the bodies were not. Thank you. Yeah, uh, again, a lot of interesting things there, especially about finding a halfway decent non-clown leader. I think we in the West are still looking for that uh, magic elixir as well. But the interesting point that you bring up, I think, you know, when you, when you talk about Estonia and Georgia and small countries that were able to reform, um, you would think somehow that this might be easier in a larger country because you have a deeper pool to draw from. And in, in, in Estonia, you know, they fired, what, 70% of the judiciary and made people reapply for their jobs. Uh, same thing in Georgia with the police. This is what they tried to do in Ukraine with the police as well. Now, why isn't it easier in larger countries with a bigger talent pool? Why did it happen in small countries? Is it the ease of changing the institutions, or was it something else? Was it that there was a diaspora? What What do you think from kind of your experience, Anders, again, following up on this one? Why did it work in small countries? Why did it not work in, in larger countries? Well, uh, I think it did work in uh, the Central European countries. Poland is not a small country. Poland worked. Uh, if you take Ukraine, the Minister of Interior, uh, Abakov, has never been considered a, an honest person. He's a, a, a businessman who comes from a rather dubious uh, background. And uh, I think that uh, the police reform in Ukraine was a typical example of how things are not done. They changed the police at the partially at the regional level. Uh, so I could see in uh, Kiev uh, that uh, uh, when they were out, they had this new, honest, uh, and well-paid and well-equipped uh, uh, patrol police. And there I saw two patrol policemen were typically watched by four old policemen who made sure that they didn't do anything bad. And if they did anything bad, the other policemen arrested the new policemen because they didn't behave properly. And uh, uh, the person who was in charge of uh, new police was first deputy minister of interior, a, a nice uh, uh, Georgian lady of considerable experience, but the minister of interior who was in charge and grad uh, soon enough uh, maneuvered her out was uh, Arsena Markov, who did not want the reforms, but he, was a, he is a smart politician, the, uh, the most heavyweight person in the Ukrainian government, and uh, uh, he did not say that he was against reform. He just wanted to modify the reform. And he modified it perfectly to his uh, liking so that it died. So the, the, the point again is you need to have uh, good people at the top who really want to do reform. If you have uh, people who don't want to uh, reform, they can always stop it. Yeah, that makes sense. We just want to have common sense. Police reform, reform. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, from the top. You can't start from the bottom. Exactly, exactly. Uh, now, we, st we started kind of this, this talk talking about kind of external aid and how external advisors might have uh, contributed to kind of the, the transition again because it was something that was not seen before and, and IMF, EBRD, all of these other organizations with EBRD created in response to this um, and Leszek already made the, the excellent point about how it had to be homegrown and, and I think Anders has, has kind of reinforced this point. 
Now, in chapter four, Oleg talks a lot about the, the, the goal of EU membership as kind of keeping some of the baser instincts of politicians in check. You know, Leszek has talked about extraordinary politics, and I think that's entirely correct, and I've utilized that in my own research. But the question is, you know, how much of a role did the EU play in stopping from backsliding on reform? And now looking forward, has that barrier gone? Can the EU no longer perform that function for the countries that are in, for the Baltic states, for Poland, for Hungary, uh, especially given what we've seen happening in these countries in terms of democratic accountability. Leszek, I know you are very vocal on this topic, so I want to hand this one to you, and then I'm going to hide under my desk here. <laughs> I have to distinguish the first wave of reforms, which started in 89, <clears throat> with the Rangers, because when we started, there was no expectations, or no firm expectations that Poland someday not in a very distant future, would join NATO and European Union. So this could not have been a factor in uh, pushing for these reforms. And this was more or less for the first two, three years. I think the expectations, firm expectations that uh, Poland's membership in the European Union is feasible appeared later. I don't remember the exact date. That's in the, around the beginning of the 90s, or certainly in the middle of the 90s. And this was a factor regarding legislation, including uh, the rule of law legislation, to some extent e economy, because we have to change our uh, legal framework in order to qualify for the single market. So the second half, yes. Once you are in, the incentives matter, because you are already in. <laughs> And you are certainly referring to what has happened in Poland in uh, 2016. The short characterization, accidents happen. So you, there is no systematic theory for accidents. You explain them after the fact. After the fact, it's pretty easy why it happened. One of the explanation is why well, the bad guys have good luck. When the bad guys have a good, good luck, it's very bad for the country. But it happens, and then you have to act. I don't want to uh, dwell into explanation why we have the present government. Uh, it was not something which could have been uh, very easily expected. First, second, uh, uh, certainly uh, um, there were some errors on the part of the oppositions. For example, uh, Donald Tusk, who is a very gifted politician, went for Brussels. I'm not blaming him for that, but certainly this has weakened the leadership of the democratic forces in Poland. So one explanation. And uh, another factor is that you can mobilize people uh, supporting all kinds of interest groups. So you're not going for the good of the country, which can be defined in the form of rule of law, uh, catching up with the West, we pick up all the interest groups and you support them. For example, pension reform in Poland was very important in the sense of increasing the retirement age, absolutely necessary uh, given uh, aging, etc. It was introduced by the former government, by Donald Tusk, but it was not very well prepared from the point of view of communication. But this was cut up by the present government. They demonized it. Uh, many people supported the reversal of the retirement age, and this have uh, gave them additional support. For this, <clears throat> we have some problems before with people who borrowed in Swiss francs on their own responsibility. They created very strong interest groups which was supported by peace. And this was completely different people, usually better off. <laughs> so on the one hand, they were using the support of less educated people who deplored the lowering the retirement age. On the other hand, they gave the support, used the support of uh, better educated and richer people who borrowed in foreign currency. 
Then I would say they joined, they are at the same time socialists and traditionalists. Mm -hmm. Socialists in a sense that they are status. So it's more power to the politicians, to the state. And this appears to many people. You always have to fight for economic freedom. But additionally, they've been using the political support of the church. So you have a Christian socialist to some extent in power. So I, there are more other factors, but I think this largely explains the victory. And once uh, they um, achieved the victory, their rule ex exceeded all their bad expectations. Exceeded, especially on the rule of law, which in practice means that you have a constitutional tribunal or Supreme Court who is competent and honest and acts accordingly. Prosecution, which is the role of prosecution in destroying or dam damaging the rule of law is not uh, properly seen, but it's crucial. So capturing prosecution is undermining, creating risks. Mm -hmm. For those who oppose the government, it is not like it is not like say in Belarus to, to say there is, but certainly, and send, and then you go for the judiciary. So what I can say, and this is on the legal, on the rule of law front. On the economy, they've been very lucky because once they started to got rules, Poland's economy accelerated because of a better situation in the European Union. And the number of Ukrainians which came to work to Poland has doubled. The number, the flow. I'm not saying that stock, the flow. Mm -hmm. so they, and they could finance uh, the gifts, social gifts. Because they went for increased social spending. And I think this combination of uh, measures and propaganda uh, I would add capturing the public media or have been turned into a tool of propaganda, I would say it resembles uh, communism in, in the extent of lies and falsities and aggression, or even worse. Now, what is the response? You have civil society, and uh, which is in Poland, I think, quite strong, uh, especially on the rule of law issue, and on the economy, independent think tanks to unmask the delayed damage, usually it is delayed, <laughs> damage done by state intervention. So mm -hmm. you refer yeah. to what I've been trying to do. Yes, I'm trying to do, being very active on Twitter. I invite everybody. I've got 300, more than 50,000, 350,000 followers. And uh, I tweet at least one of them, once a day. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it, it's it's a funny point that, you know, kind of the way Donald Tusk left for Brussels and how there, there's no longer the carrot of joining the EU. Oh. But and in fact, the EU was able to take and kind of weaken the opposition, uh, not through any fault of its own. Like you said, you know, don't don't uh, kind of cast dispersions on Tusk for doing it, because obviously it's a very good position. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I've got some good questions that have come in via Facebook, and I'm going to throw this out to both of you guys. Uh, it's from Elodie Duarn, who has worked worked closely with Oleg over the past couple of years, um, especially putting together a handbook for Paul Grave. Uh, she thanks the speakers for some great points, and she wants to know if you could speak a bit about the differences between perceptions and reality in people's appreciation of the outcomes of reforms and transition. Is that Ola discusses this in section 7.3, pointing at changing aspirations. Would love to hear your views. So this would be interesting to see, you know, what were expectations met? Were they exceeded or were they underwhelmed? And this kind of led to backsliding. So I'll throw that, whoever wants to answer that, please. Okay, if uh, I could uh, start on it. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, think that um, uh, the expectations have changed very much uh, during the course of events. If you take now the standard Russian view of uh, the Soviet Union is that uh, Russia was then strong and respected and they don't remember that there were shortages and that uh, Russia was extremely poor. 
So they think uh, that uh, Russia has lost one thing and they have forgotten the, uh, the other thing. And this has been reinforced by showing old Soviet films on television, which are quite nice. And you don't uh, uh, see the, the situation. And also uh, with regard to the, the economic situation in uh, Poland specifically, uh, Leszek talked about uh, uh, delayed damage of a bad policy, but of course we also have a delayed uh, advantage that economic growth under Orban and in uh, Hungary and uh, in uh, Poland under PIS has been high. We have seen a growth of 4-5% uh, a year. There has been a certain convergence and this is at a time when the European Union has had a, a growth rate of 1-2%. Uh, 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 so what we have been seeing in Hungary since uh, 2012 is that uh, governance has been deteriorating according to the, uh, the Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International in Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovakia since uh, around 2015. And, but it doesn't have a big effect as yet, but it's the wrong direction. What is happening to higher education? Is it improving? Hardly. Is the, are these countries moving ahead in research and development? No, it's very much a catch up growth, as is actually the case with, uh, with China. It's not uh, moving over to the uh, high innovation uh, 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 growth, uh, and that's where these countries need to go. So it is sort of a successful dead end that these countries are entering to. And Hungary has now fallen to the de deplorable level of governments of Bulgaria and Romania. So the only three countries that are really moving ahead uh, in, uh, among the, the new EU members is the Baltic countries that are persistently improving their uh, governance uh, situation while well, Central Europe is uh, falling behind, Bulgaria and Romania are catching uh, up uh, a bit, but it uh, uh, should be more. But the big uh, basket case is really Hungary, but we don't see it on its economic growth as yet. It will come. The, de the delayed damage about which Lesh speak. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, then one last question. I guess this one is for Leszek and will really take us full circle. Um, you know, I asked it at the beginning about the IMF and the EU. Uh, I started my professional career at the Harvard Institute for International Development in 1996, and I got to work with Jeff Sachs. You worked with him a few years beforehand and uh, probably a little bit more intimately. What was kind of the role of Jeff and, of course, David Lipton in terms of maybe not helping to formulate what was done in Poland, but as ambassadors to kind of sell it to the rest of the world? Well, they were very helpful, both of them, perhaps more Jeff than David. You know, David was also perhaps not so much in the media, but in direct touch, he was very good. Now, uh, they help to publicize that a rapid approach is better than slow. So they help in selling this big bank, which we have uh, prepared. And both of them, but again, Jeff, was very helpful in our uh, try to get uh, debt reduction, which, uh, especially in the US, and without the US, you would not get uh, this concession from, say, the Japanese. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, I'm looking at the time. It's five o'clock here, Central European Standard Time, summertime. Um, I want to thank our guests, Leszek Balserovic, Anders Oslin. Um, a lot of interesting things have been said in terms of kind of the themes from Oleg's book, in terms of what has happened before with the transition, and now... 10 years, 12 years, 15 years on from the global financial crisis, 
still in the middle of kind of COVID and, and emerging from it. It will be interesting to see what the next transition is, if the transition is positive, if we see kind of this retrenchment, uh, if we need to have kind of our next series of radical reforms that will take us forward. Uh, Jagosh, if you are there, you if you have any closing comments from the case side, uh, I would hand it over to you. And if not, then I guess I will be the one then to remind everyone about the case 30th anniversary conference in September, September 23rd and 24th in Warsaw. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. I'd like to thank our panelists and I hope to see you all in Warsaw with everyone vaccinated in September. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Hi.